Greetings. My name is Kevin Regick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Today's conversation addresses a, a hard, enlightening, and challenging discussion regarding Christian nationalism and the Seven Mountain Mandate. The debate took place months ago, actually, our discussion, really, uh, but it caused me to reevaluate some of my positions. So now I want to share them with you and with those I earlier had this conversation with. So jump in the car and let's ride. Uh, I'm going to get straight to the point. I come before you today with a somewhat heavy heart and a humbled spirit. For many years, the Seven Mountain Mandate was a large part of my theology. Its concepts and teachings were ushered into mainstream society quickly, and uh, when I was introduced to them, I immediately embraced them. In my service as a teacher in several churches, I have echoed the teaching of C. Peter Wagner, including the ideal of the Seven Mountain Mandate. And uh, from here, I'll refer to it simply as the Seven M. And like many of us uh, who was introduced to this uh, concept, I believe that uh, as a church, we were called to have dominion over society by taking control of the seven key areas of influence that shape society, which the mountains represented. At the time, it just made sense in consideration of the great commission that we were called to obtain. The seven M or seven mountain mandate assumes that leadership is about rulership and exerting control from the top down to effect change. The doctrine of seven M was birthed and flowed from the Christian organization known as the NAR of the New Apostolic Reformation Movement and one of the pioneers and chief theologians of NAR was C. Peter Wagner. Mr. Wagner has passed on now and the organization has taken on a different agenda, message, and even method. It has taken on a major shift that I now am not comfortable with. And one of the leading individuals in this shift is an individual by the name of Lance Warner. I would call this a, a, a fairly extreme form of Christian nationalism though. This is, this is a hardened form of Christian nationalism. What I would even call, at least in the case of Lance Wall now, a form of Christian supremacy. But these folks believe that Christians, by dint of being Christians, should have more rights and privileges in society, and that Christianity should be privileged over other worldviews, over other perspectives, whether they be religious or non-religious in society, that Christianity and Christians should have a coercive power over the rest of society. And I think that that is actually a real danger to democracy. So I, I've got a book coming out about um, January 6th, and January 6th didn't happen overnight. There, there was a long process, there was a long buildup during the 2020 election of discourse like this, of conversations like this, that said, our country is on the verge of collapse unless Donald Trump wins. And in fact, there were many people from these communities, including people like Lance Wano, who said, our prophets tell us that Donald Trump is destined to win this election, that he must win this election, that it's God's will for him to win this election. And once Donald Trump denied the results of the election, people like Lance Wano and many of the speakers here today were a part of the mobilization effort to enlist Christians to buy into Donald Trump's election lies and to use Christian spirituality and Christian theology to undergird and support and propagandize those election lies. And then many of the people who were leaders in this movement also showed up on January 6th and were key in mobilizing Christians and galvanizing Christians to be there and then showed up there themselves because they really believed that the election was being stolen. Not, not because they had any facts to back that up, but because they had prophecies, because they had experiences that told them, they had, they had a gut feeling 
that Donald Trump was right. And that led them to participate in an attempt in many ways to overthrow our democracy. That, that to me is what's so concerning, is we are now heading into another election where Donald Trump is one of the major candidates. And what happens if Donald Trump loses and denies the results again? Much of the rhetoric here today, much of the rhetoric you hear from people who are part of this movement, they're saying they got away with stealing one election from us and from Trump. We're not gonna let that happen again. Believe that it was a demonic conspiracy that stole the 2020 election. And this was a major factor in what happened on January 6th, where Christian believers who believed that a conspiracy of demons manifesting through the Democratic Party, manifesting through disloyal Republicans, manifesting through Mike Pence, had was preventing Trump from winning the election and from fulfilling the will of God. This rhetoric that is going on here parallels that very, very directly. So it's not just disagreement, it's demonism. It's, 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 yes, they, they, are, they are literally demonizing their enemies and saying our enemies are inspired by demons. In fact, Wallnow just this past week said that Kamala Harris, you can't even hear her speaking because it's just demons speaking through her. Now, before I go further on this subject, I need to say something. Uh, I've come to believe that the 7M mandate is deeply flawed theological model, not supported by the teachings or life examples of Jesus. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this, the basic teaching is that the kingdom of God and the Great Commission uh, referred to in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, uh, are tied to taking certain mountains of culture or influence and expanding the overarching presence of the mountain of God upon them through our influence. The seven mountain mandate ideology is subversive now and, and causing many to run after positional and transactional leadership rather than seeking the transformational leadership based on the work of building relationships, the word of God, and the empowering, leading, guiding, and directing of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, today, I want to publicly apologize to my former students and other hearers for promoting this doctrine. After weeks of prayer, research, and study, I realized that this teaching is not in line with the true message of Christ. The ideal of dominating and controlling society goes against everything that Jesus taught us about humility, love, and servant leadership. As I delve deeper into this doctrine and, and how it is being used to manipulate people today, I started to see the danger and harm it can cause. The ideal of taking control of institutions goes against the very essence of the gospel. To love our neighbors as ourselves and to be a light in the world, not a force of domination. Again, I want to sincerely apologize to anyone who may have been uh, misguided, misled by my previous teaching. It was never my intention to spread a harmful agenda, but rather to fulfill what I believe was my calling as a teacher of the Word of God. And I do thank you for humbly listening to my apology. And I pray that we can move forward together, uniting in our mission to spread the unconditional love and grace of our Savior and to uh, legitimately uh, represent Christ and the purpose and destiny of his coming to save us so that we can be agents of uh, advancing his kingdom in a way that is pleasing to God. Today I stand before you with a renewed understanding of the true message of Christ. And we are not called to take control of society but rather to serve and love it. That is our power of influence. That is how we win others over to the kingdom of God. We are not called to create our own kingdom here on earth, 
but to advance and, and, and invite others into the kingdom of God. We are called to be agents of change through love, not dominion. According to the internet, the concept was birthed by Bill Bright, Lauren Cunningham, and Francis Schaeffer, a Christian philosopher. But according to C. Peter Wagner, the Seven Mountain Theory arose from a conversation he had with Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. He says that they met at a conference and Bright was talking about a dream or a vision he had the previous night in which there were seven mountains that God was telling Christians to climb and control in order to institute God's kingdom on earth. Wagner said that he had the exact same dream, so they concluded that they were getting a message from God. In Wagner's view, Christians would clean up the culture from within and then hand a purified culture to Christ at his second coming. Maybe that's another reason why the concept has gotten distorted into a plan to control people like a cult. (laughs) And then in walks Donald J. Trump, whom the leaders of this movement now have declared to be their prophet. In my time of study and reflection, I came across a book entitled The False White Gospel rejecting Christian nationalism, reclaiming true faith and refounding democracy. It was written by the University of Georgetown professor and theologian, James Wallace. He is a theologian who was originally raised as a conservative white evangelical uh, Christian and who was a member of an evangelical church. Wallace describes his own calling and mission to ministry as awkward by his experiences in the black church after he was kicked out of his white church in the midst of asking questions about race and justice as a teenager. He also leads the Center on Faith and Justice at Georgetown University. And we're in the library of Jim Wallace. Jim, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Glad to have you here in my office. So, Jim, very briefly, before we get into some of the nitty-gritty of this, tell my audience who you are and what your influence is in Christian theology. Well, that's a good question. Some people call me a public theologian, uh, activist for a long time. I started, founded, and ran Sojourners for a long, long time. Now I've moved to Georgetown where they named this wonderful chair after my mentor, uh, tutor, teacher, friend. It's it's the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Chair of Faith and Justice, and then a center on faith and justice. Jim. Well, you mentioned this uh, movement you've covered before. Well, a movement is afoot. A new movement is afoot that's growing to counter, to confront the kind of white, Christian nationalism that's supporting Donald Trump. Uh, And it's very diverse, black churches. Black evangelicals are different than white evangelicals. People of color, Catholics, uh, Protestants, all kind of people. We pull together this wee weekend, all these people. And what we're saying is very simple. Uh, It's Christian nationalism versus Jesus. So much of the teaching of this movement that you covered, I believe, is literally antithetical to the teachings of Jesus. So how do we restore genuine faith? The answer to bad religion, in my view, isn't no religion. I've got friends that feel that way. Some days I feel that too. But the answer to bad religion is better faith, genuine faith. So this movement that I'm uh, blessed to be part of is really trying to restore and reclaim Jesus in the midst of a public and political debate. But there are power brokers who are using religion to promote fear and hate and even violence. I mean, white Christian nationalism. The name spells the problem. 
Proponents of the Seven M Mandate call on Christians to retake seven spheres or mountains of cultural influence. Those are religion, family, government, education, media, arts, slash entertainment, and business. The Seven M Mandate proclaims that Christians are called to seize control of what is referred to as the Seven Mountains of Influence. Actually, in some circles, there are more than seven mountains. In fact, in, in my teaching of this concept, I even added a mountain of technology. The seven in concept is void of any likeness to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible are believers uh, explicitly called to invade the top tiers of society nor does the Bible talk about any particular mountains of society. In fact, it would seem that God's method is often to use the least influential people in a society to make the biggest changes. Jesus did not tell his disciples to seek positions of leadership, but to love as he loved. Jesus himself came humbly, according to Philippians 2, uh, 5 and 11 and often chose those of low esteem in society as his followers and witnesses. 